if you are able, would you please stand as God calls us, calls us to worship him from his word. Psalm 105, verses 1 through 3. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Amen. Please remain standing as we worship the Lord together in song. Good morning. Let's sing the doxology together. It is my privilege to lead us in pastoral prayer this morning. Bow with me as we approach our King. Almighty Father, we praise you and rejoice that you are the all-powerful God, creator and sustainer of all things, who spoke all things into existence from nothing. You are the author and finisher of our faith, who brings life out of death, and gives us new hearts and new affections that we might see clearly through the eyes of faith 
that the heavens and the earth declare your glory and proclaim your handiwork, just as your word says. You are great and greatly to be praised. You made us, and we are the sheep of your pasture, depending on you for all things every day and safe under your watchful eye and tender care. We come before you this morning, covered in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, with thankful hearts by the Holy Spirit, and proclaim together that you are the one to whom all glory and praise are due. We rejoice that you do not delight in our strength, for we have none to mention. But you take pleasure in those who fear you and in those who hope in your steadfast love. And therefore, we are free to confess our sins to you, that our fellowship with you this morning would be unbroken. Would you stir our hearts to remember the ways in which we have sinned against you this week in thought, in word, and in deed, that we might confess our sins to you silently and individually now. We rejoice that we're not justified by our good works, even by the quality of our repentance, but we are justified by your grace alone through faith in Jesus Christ, according to your word and for your glory. For the scripture declares, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. What a blessing and a privilege and an honor to be adopted as your children and welcomed into your presence for all eternity and to be able to gather here with brothers and sisters who dwell in unity on this Lord's day to worship you. We pray for our worship service this, this morning. Would you display the love of Christ for us today that we might be encouraged to press on in these difficult days? Show us grace, love, compassion, and mercy. Above all, show us Christ and our need for him that we may repent of our self-reliance and cast ourselves heart and soul upon your mercy, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit, that we might walk in a manner worthy of the gospel. Bless our tithes and offerings this morning that the work of the gospel that you are doing through Truth Point Church might continue. We pray for other faithful churches in our area, and we lift up Spanish River Church to you and their pastor, David Cassidy. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would anchor them to your word, that they may grow in grace, in faith, in holiness, and in love, and that they would give glory to you in all things. Bless their continued work for the kingdom, networking faithful pastors and planting churches, and set their hearts firmly on Christ. We lift up our missionary Pablo Torres and Lavina, Hispanic church plant for which he labors. And we praise you for the amazing reports of fruitfulness of that ministry for making disciples and growing them to maturity and roles in ministry. Thank you for their outreach and granting them favor in their community and with government agencies. May their work continue unhindered, that your fame may continue to spread. And would you be pleased to grow their leadership and add more to the membership of that church? As we reflect this week on the passing of two of your servants, Harry Reeder and Tim Keller, we grieve with those who grieve lifting up not only the families of these men and their close friends and acquaintances, but the thousands of saints who were positively impacted by their ministries over so many years. But we do not grieve as those who have no hope, for we know that the death of your saints is precious in your sight, for their joy is made complete in your presence and their struggles are over. So would you grant that hope to all who grieve and remind them that we have a sure hope that all who trust in Jesus will be reunited on that great day and remain forever together in the presence and peace of our King. Lord, confirm this truth in all of our hearts, that our hope will not put us to shame or disappoint, and our faith will surely be turned one day to sight. And finally, we pray the Lord's Prayer corporately, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
responsive reading this week uh, comes from Psalm 146, verses 5 through 10. Uh, it is easiest to follow along in the worship guide uh, as I will start, uh, and then you can repeat, uh, read the part that says people, and then we'll all sing the, <laughs> say the last verse together. All right, so Psalm 146, 5 through 10. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them, all that is in them, who keeps faith forever. The Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow and the fatherless, but the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. Your good is on all generations. Praise the Lord. All right. And so this week is not Memory Verse Sunday, but I'll take this time to remind you to, to read that, to get that in your hearts, and be ready for next week. All right. Let's all stand and continue to worship.
us, my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to will. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is all. holy bound to him. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing. All is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is dark. Before you have a seat, please turn and greet your neighbor with the peace of Christ, especially if you see someone you don't recognize. Please introduce yourself. Start our sermon in a minute or two.
All right, you can make your way to your seat. That'd be great. One announcement I forgot to make is that uh, over the summer, we're going to be expanding our monthly Sunday school program to include all of our kids. So if you have kids and you want to come to Sunday school, there's a class. Yes, there's a class for you, for, uh, for kids that Cisco is going to head up uh, in the Shar, and then Clint will continue to lead the monthly uh, uh, Sunday school for, for everyone else. So, uh, so that's going to start next month. Our passage this morning is Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. If you have your Bible, please take it and turn there. We continue in this chapter in which the Apostle Paul addresses how people who have been saved by grace in Jesus Christ are to conduct themselves in this world. It is, as we've seen, a practical chapter of Scripture. And, uh, and as we've discussed many times before, Christianity is unique from all other religions in that salvation always does and, and indeed must come before a life of obedience, right? That is, uh, in contrast with every other religion on earth, in which if you do well enough, if you work hard enough, if you prove yourself worthy of salvation, then you can attain it, right? That's every other belief system on earth, that work precedes salvation. Not so according to the word of God. In the Bible, we learn that no one is able to do well enough, to work hard enough to please a holy God. And if there is to be salvation, it must be a gift. And yes, it is a gift found in Jesus Christ, who alone is worthy enough to please a holy God. And then, in grateful response to his undeserved love, do we respond with a life uh, that is meant to bring him glory, to reflect his holy law. As Romans 6.23 puts it, for the wages of sin is death. That's what we earn. That's what our works get. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Well, today we're in the second part of this uh, clothing metaphor from the Apostle Paul that describes what a life lived in response to this salvation looks like. You remember last week we saw that we were to put off or to take off the sinful practices and desires that belong to literally the old man, that is Adam, that belong to the old nature that we're all born with. Uh, well, today, today we are going to see that we're called uh, to replace it with something else, to put on the actions and motivations that reflect the salvation found in Jesus Christ. So, as we hear God's holy word together, I would invite you once again, if you are able to stand. I'll be reading Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17 in the English Standard Version. Brothers and sisters, this is God's holy word. Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and... One has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness to God in your hearts. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you for this word. We thank you, Lord, for giving Christ your son for us. We thank you. Lord, for lighting a path, a light on our path to follow in your word. Oh, Lord, give us tender hearts, we pray. Let them be receptive to your word. We pray this for the glory of your name and in Jesus' name. Amen. Please have a seat. John Calvin, in his uh, probably greatest work, The Institutes of the Christian Religion, summarized the Christian life, all of the Christian life, in one hyphenated word. Anyone know what that one hyphenated word is? Self-denial. All the Christian life can be summarized in one hyphenated word, self-denial. Now, no one ever accused John Calvin of being a great marketer, 
Uh, he missed, apparently, the class on how to be a great salesman for the church. Rather, he wrote this. We are not our own. Insofar as we can, let us therefore forget ourselves and all that is ours. Conversely, we are God's. That is, we belong to God. Let us therefore live for him and die for him. We are God's. Let all the parts of our life accordingly strive toward him. It's not a... Uh, it's not a message that would be shaped by a marketer. It's not one that would bring in the masses based on consumer desires. But it's a great summary of the word of God. It's beautiful. It's true. But it's so, so hard. So hard. The promotion of our own interests, our own advancement, and the dependence upon our own wisdom is what we need to spend a lifetime putting to death. For we are born seeking those things. We are born with ourselves at the center of the universe. We are born looking at other people as being there for the advancement of our own desires. But we must die to that, even as Christ has died for us. And this is hard, so how do we get there? What is the, what is the motivation to get us there? Well, the truth is that the only thing that can inspire a man or a woman to dedicate his or her life to denying the self Indeed, the only truth that could do such a, a countercultural or we could say supernatural thing is understanding the love of God found in Jesus Christ. That's what holds it all together. That's what can motivate us to die to self, to deny our inner desires, those things that we were born in, is knowing the positive beauty of the love of God. This is throughout the scriptures told to be the case. Psalm 63, 3 because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. The love of the Lord is better than all of life, anything that we could find seeking our own glory. And then in 1 John 4, 9, in this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. That is love. You notice probably in the middle of our passage today in verse 14, Paul articulates this foundational principle of the Christian life, as he writes, and above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. You see, fear of punishment cannot truly motivate our hearts to give ourselves away. Can't. Nor could guilt, nor embarrassment, nor shame, nor duty. Truly, the only way that we can begin to live a life of putting on Christ, of denying our own interests, the only way that we could put Christ on as a garment and seek to follow him in obedience is to know that we have his love from the start, to know and to value the love of God found in Jesus Christ. And, and that's what we're going to consider together as we look at this passage. We're going to consider what we've been clothed with in this salvation found in Jesus Christ. And this is our outline. If you're taking notes, you'll find it printed for you uh, there. We're going to see that we are clothed with a beloved love, a forgiving love, and a worshipful love. First, we are clothed with a beloved love. In 1 John 4.10, it says, In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And this is the very same message that Paul opens with. In verse 12, we read, Put on then, that's a command, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. So he begins the command. This is how you are to live according to, uh, to the law of God. This is how you are to respond to the salvation that is yours. But before he can get to the object of what they are to put on, he interrupts himself. He reminds them of their status. You are God's chosen and holy and beloved ones. This, uh, this alludes to the way God described Israel in the Old Covenant. In Deuteronomy 7, 6, we read, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. This is Moses when he's nearing the end of his life, and he's reminding the people once again of the covenant that is theirs, where he retells the law to them, and he, and he preaches this great summary of the faith to them. And he says, You are holy to the Lord. You are treasured by the Lord. And, and lest they think that it was because of something you know, innate in them or because of how, how well they had behaved the last 
40 years in the wilderness wanderings, he, he, almost, he almost interrupts himself with a qualifier. He said, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers. He chose them and loved them, not because they were good, nor because they were many, but he chose them because he loved them, and he loved them because he chose them. He made them to be the recipients of his love, though they did not deserve a single ounce of it. And it's remarkable, remarkable because what Paul is doing is saying to the mostly Gentile church at Colossae that, that this is what is true of you. And what, what we must understand here in West Palm Beach in the year 2023 is that this is true of us, that, that we have been brought into God's beloved Israel, that we are the new, are now holy to the Lord, that we are part of his covenant people through Christ, the second Adam, the one true Israel, that you are the new Israel and the new creation made alive in Christ and to be clothed with Christ means to be the recipients of his undeserved love. And that is the source of all of our works. It is never to earn his love. It is to reflect his love. Uh, the, the Anglican Book of Prayer was first published in the year 1549 and then later updated in 1610. And it's, it's been uh, influential in many church traditions, liturgies, including our own. The one example that you may be even unwittingly familiar with is the wedding service, which comes from the book of church order. I'm sorry, book of church order, which comes from the book of common prayer. The beginning of a wedding ceremony goes like this. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today in the presence of God to witness and bless the joining together of this man and this woman in holy matrimony. That's the book of common prayer, right? Written 500 years ago almost. And this dearly beloved is the noun form of the word that we find here in verse 12, which we see is beloved. And the King James Version, the old version that they had back then when they wrote the Book of Common Prayer, translated this word when it's used throughout the New Testament addressing the church as dearly beloved. Dearly beloved. This is, this is one of the favorite apostolic addresses of the church. Dearly beloved. And, uh, and I, I love that we use it at the beginning of wedding services as it, it's a reminder as people enter into this lifelong covenant of marriage that, that the only chance they have of keeping the vows that they're about to make, the only chance they, they have of, of following a life of obedience towards this, this new member of your flesh that you're about to be joined to is by knowing that you are first beloved of God, that, that the knowledge of being loved by God is the source of of all of our obedience. I'm sure uh, many of you heard that this, you know, small, tiny appendage of the body of Christ that is, uh, that is the PCA, our denomination, was dealt two massive blows this week. And thank you, Jason, for praying for, uh, for the families of our brothers as, as we lost two faithful PCA pastors, Tim Keller and Harry Reader. Tim, of course, of Redeemer PCA in New York City, and Harry Reader of Briarwood Church in Birmingham, Alabama. It's been, uh, it's been quite overwhelming for me personally, considering they're two men's and they're, these two men and their incredible influence on me and, and so many of you. And I'd actually like to uh, ask for your prayers as I travel to Birmingham this week to celebrate and to honor Dr. Reader, who uh, is truly one of my heroes um, at his funeral. But I came across uh, a quote from Keller this week that relates to this passage. He said, everything in this life is going to be taken away from us except one thing, God's love, which can go into death with us and take us through it and into his arms. It's beautiful. He knows that now. It's so true. Everything will be taken away from us at some point in this short life we live, but not God's love. You are beloved of God, Christian. And it is God's love that enables us to do what we are called to do here in verse 12, to put on compassionate hearts, to put on kindness and humility and meekness and patience. We can go about doing these things because we have 
first received those very things from God in Christ, that he was the truly compassionate one, that he was kind, that he was humble, that he was meek and mild, that he showed such patience for us. And so we are clothed with a beloved love. Secondly, we see that we're clothed with a forgiving love. This putting on of Christ is described this way in verse 13. Please glance down there again. Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Now, this is a common command in the New Testament. That you, also, you must forgive one another. Why is that? Why is it repeated so much? Well, it's an obvious question with an obvious answer, isn't it? It's because we sin a lot against each other. There's rampant sinning against our neighbors found in the church. And, and because we sin with such regularity in the church, we have the opportunity to follow our Lord's pattern of forgiving often. A life with people anywhere presumes pain, right? Presumes debt. Inside the church, it is no different. And so we are called to be constantly forgiving. And Paul here moves in his description of putting on Christ from treating people in a holy manner in verse 12 to how to deal with people when they don't. We are to bear with one another. We are not to bear with false teaching. That's actually a lot of what the first two chapters of Colossians were about. But we are to bear with one another, even as Christ has, is bearing with us, right? And we do this, we are told, because we have already been forgiven so much by God. And when we, when we consider the sins of others up against in the same context of what God has forgiven us, then the choice to forgive someone else is easy at least in theory, right? But what we do is when someone sins against us, the last thing we want to do is to think about how we have sinned against God, right? That's something else altogether. Let's focus on <laughs> context is king. Let's focus on the immediate problem of someone else bothering me. But we're always called in Christ when someone sins against us to think about how much we have been forgiven by Christ. That is a very practical application here. And this is why in the book of Ephesians and also in 1 Peter, when we're called to forgive, it always says, because you've been forgiven, right? It's what we pray in the Lord's Prayer, right? As we also have forgiven our debtors, right? We always, when we're sinned against, in order to put on Christ, as we clothe ourselves, we must always, when sinned again, think about how much we've sinned against God and how much we have been forgiven. I read that uh, an ever-growing percentage of people in America are getting their news from Twitter. That is, links to news articles and videos found in their Twitter feed. I don't remember the exact number, but it's a growing trend for people to ordinarily look at their phone or I guess at their computer rather than sit down and watch the nightly news or watch cable news. It's easier, it's quicker, and I'm certainly included in that number. And in scrolling through my news feed, I'm amazed at how many voices there are in the world, that I, voices I've never heard of, who are offering some point of, of, of professional advice. In every area of life, every angle of news you could possibly look at a, at a, at a story from, I, I see it in my feed. Even in the realm of Christian thought, this makes it difficult to know who to trust. Right? Do you ever feel that? I, I don't know if who I'm reading here is, is legit. I, I, don't know if, I don't know if this is a cult. I, I don't know if this is a really faithful word from God. Right? It's, it's difficult to know, and, and, and we can't answer all those questions right here, right now. But, but here is one way for sure you can know if someone is from God or not from God. The people who downplay the need for repentance of sin and forgiveness of sin are not speaking for the Lord Jesus. Those people who, for example, present turning from sinful lifestyles or dying to nat natural passions, uh, things that are uh, impossible to accomplish in this confusing world, and so we should just accept people the way they are. People, the, the great command of Jesus is for you to love yourself as you are, I say those are the people who are not faithful to Scripture. You should not be listening to them. 
because we are clothed with a forgiving love. And that forgiving love is one that recognizes the destructive nature of sin and the beautiful freedom of God's pardon in Jesus Christ. We have been clothed with Christ in order to forgive others, for we are called into one body. That's what it says in verse 15. It says we are called to live in the peace of Christ, to let it rule in our hearts, to let peace be the controlling law in us and around us. So what this means, friends of Truth Point Church, if you have something against your brother or sister in Christ, go to him or go to her. Don't take it to your bed in anger. Don't let it stew in your heart, and certainly don't take it to someone else to gossip. Go to your brother and sister. Forgive them. Let sin be the playing field for God's forgiving and restoring power. I don't know how many of you are ice hockey fans. I know at least my friend Chris Kushner is one. He's from the great city of Pittsburgh, but, uh, but hockey was my first sports love as a boy. My earliest memory is sitting with my father on one of those old, like, weaving chairs that had, like, yarn for a cover. We're talking, like, late 70s, early 80s. And, you know, uh, hockey players are, are uniquely remarkable athletes, especially when it comes to injuries and pain. If a player, say, gets hit in the face with a puck, like a frozen piece of rubber or a stick, and there's a large gash in his face, the normal thing for him to do is to go into the locker room, get stitches, and come right back out and play. That's normal for hockey players. It's not normal for me. I'd quit the sport. That would be it. Thank you. I'm done. But same game, go back in. And there's an expression used in hockey circles about that, and it's this. The faith, the faith, the face is a long way from the heart. The face is a long way from the heart. Now, of course, this isn't literal. It's about, what, a foot? The face is about a foot from the heart. But in hockey terms, in hockey terms, just because your face is mangled, it doesn't mean that you can't be driven by your heart to play. You know, it's, it's wild, but, it, but it's kind of deep. It's kind of uh, inspiring. And we could say this principle applies to the way we're called to forgive others. If someone sins against you, if someone slaps you in the face, as the Lord said in his sermon on the mount, you realize that the face is a long way from the heart. You have had your sins forgiven by a holy God. He has given you a heart of flesh in exchange for the heart of stone that you were born in. And so you are able to forgive others. You are able to turn the other cheek, as it were, and to bear with one another and to forgive one another. We have been clothed with a forgiving love. Third and finally, we see that we are clothed with a worshipful love. It is in verse 16 that a couple of the most well-known phrases from the book of Colossians reside. The verse begins with the imperative or the command, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And then later we read a description of that command, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Of course, we know that Jesus is the word of God, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us as Josh Malone preached so powerfully to us a couple weeks ago from John chapter 1. So when we read the word of Christ, we can understand it simply as being Christ himself, his, his person, his work, his mediation for us, yes? But it also means all of the teachings of Scripture, all which come from the authority of Christ, that, that all of God's Word testify to Christ and come from Him. The written Word of God, the Bible, is to be at the center of the Christian's life. It is to dwell in our hearts through the lens of Christ who came fulfilling every command to die for my sins. We are to teach and admonish one another, we are told, in all wisdom knowing the word of Christ, having it dwell in our hearts richly. And then we have this picture, which we could say frames the last section of our passage, that we are to sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in our hearts to God. That at the center of this beloved and forgiving life we live is the reality that we are called to worship God. That, that, 
that Christianity is not a, simply a, a rule book on how we are to live. If so, we all fail. All of us fail. But Christianity is rather a life of worship to a God who, though we don't deserve it as all, at all, loves us with a perfect love, who came in the flesh and obeyed where we failed and who died to pay for our failure of all those rules that, that we are called to worship God. It's the life of the Christian to worship God. It's interesting that, that singing is described alongside teaching. Look at, look at what it says. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with th thankfulness in your hearts to God. Though we are directing our songs to God, we are also being taught about him as we sing. And this is, you know, a good aside that this is why in church we should not only sing psalms, which we are commanded here to do, but we should also seek for all the hymns and all the spiritual songs that we sing to be deep, to be rich in truth. That shallow praise choruses that, that more resemble a mantra than a hymn will not do in the worship of Christ. For we are taught when we sing. We need to sing together robust and deep songs about God, about his glorious salvation found in Christ, about his promises that are ours, that God grows us and teaches us as we sing to him. And though I'm, I'm, I'm un, uncertain as to whether or not this was Paul's immediate intent, that is uh, certainly debatable. What is clear is that in verses 15 through 17, we actually see here all of the elements of public worship. Paul's writing to the church. They're gathered in worship to hear this letter read, and we see the worship service described. Look, we are to sing praises to God in song. We are to let the word of Christ dwell in those forgiven in Christ, in our confessing our sins and the assurance of God par God's pardon in Christ. We are to give thanks in Jesus' name in, uh, to the Father as we go to him in prayer. We have the teaching and the admonishing and the preaching of the word, and we let the peace of Christ rule as we are called to one body at the Lord's table. That's everything we're doing this morning, and it's what our hearts need. We need to worship God who saved us. We need to hear the gospel proclaimed again and again as we're gathered together on the first day by the Holy Spirit. We need to worship every day that all of life is worship, and we need to be gathered at the start of the week together to be reminded of the unity we have in Christ. We need it as we need clothing, for it is our clothing. We have been clothed with a worshipful love. This idea of clothing that we've been looking at the past couple weeks of, of taking off the old man and its nature and putting on the new man and his nature um, is a metaphor that Paul is using here, but it actually alludes to something in the Old Testament and alludes to a passage of scripture found in Zechariah chapter 3. You'll find this passage or part of it printed for you in the worship guide. Now, I'm going to read it and we'll talk about it for, for a brief moment and then we'll be done. And read Zechariah 3, 1 through 4. It's printed for you in the worship guide. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joseph was standing before the angel, clothed with filthy garments, and the angel said to those who were standing before him, Remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. Zechariah is a wonderful book about a series of dreams or visions given to the prophet Zechariah around the year 520 B.C. It was right after Judah returned to the promised land after their Babylonian exile, and they were getting ready to rebuild the temple, which had been destroyed. And this scene in chapter 3 is a vision given to the prophet about the high priest on the Day of Atonement. That is Yom Kippur in Hebrew. We know that, that it was the Day of Atonement that is being described because on that day alone, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would stand before God in the most holy place within the temple. On that day, two animals were involved, a lamb 
and a scapegoat. And the, and the priest sacrificed the lamb on the altar for the sins of the people. And then the priest laid his hands on the scapegoat and would verbally confess all the sins of the people. And then they would let him go. And, and the people understood that a transfer was taking place, that God was dealing with their sin on that day, that he was pardoning them uh, and accepting these goats, this, this lamb and this goat as, as their substitute that the goat was making a substitution for the people and its identity was becoming their sin and it was sent away. Now normally, the high priest uh, in, his, in his daily sacrifices wore these wore, wore very uh, elaborate clothing. He, he, he wore jewels and splendid garments meant to mirror the glory of God, the brightness of God, but not on the Day of Atonement. This is fascinating. On the Day of Atonement alone, he was to wear a single white robe and a turban, a head cover, as commanded in the book of Leviticus. Very simple clothing would he wear on that day as he was to go into the inner sanctum and be in the presence of God. And though that was simple, though the clothing was simple, the preparation for that day by the high priest was anything but simple. According to ancient Jewish writings, the Talmud, written around this time, because the law said that the touching of a corpse made a person unclean for a week. In order to prepare the high priest for the Day of Atonement, they would put him in an apartment adjoining the temple building a full week before the day so that he couldn't accidentally brush into something unclean, something dead. In addition to that, priests would keep him up all night, the night before the Day of Atonement, and would pray with him as a night vigil. Right? They didn't want him doing anything mentally that would be unclean because they were preparing for the day. So he didn't sleep at all the night before. And when he awoke, he would take five different baths, head to toe, and he would also ceremonially wash his hands and feet ten times in order to make sure that he was clean to make the sacrifice on the Day of Atonement. He cleaned himself over and over again. In fact, the last bath that he took, the people were so concerned that their one representative, their high priest, be ritually clean, that they would actually watch, all the people would watch him bathe from behind a curtain. It was this, this great um, ceremony in order to make sure that the high priest, when he stood before the Lord, was clean. What a shock then it is to read in Zechariah chapter 3 to see the high priest clothed with filthy rags. Did you see that? Now Joshua was standing before the angel clothed with filthy garments. This would have been shocking to the original hearers of it. How could he be filthy? We've, we've gone to so much effort to make sure he's clean. How can he be filthy? In, in fact, the Hebrew, and I, I debated on whether or not to say this, but the Hebrew actually reads that his clothes were covered in human excrement. That's the vision. You see, what we are seeing in this vision is not what the people would see physically with their eyes, but rather it is what God sees. That no matter how much and how much effort was made to be ritually pure, the human heart was still so stained with sin that it is as if or covered with the worst kind of filth imaginable. That was, that was the high priest on the holiest day through God's holy eyes, and there Zechariah is, seeing the vision that God sees, as well as Satan accusing him. So what does God do? Well, he speaks on behalf of Joshua. Did you see it? He rebukes Satan by his own name, and then he removes the sinful clothing and redresses Joshua the high priest, and by association, all of God's people. It's a, it's a picture of salvation by grace alone and not by works, that God is the one who cleanses us, who changes us, that there's nothing left for the accuser to say that God has himself removed the stains and clothed God's people with his own righteousness. But how would he do it? How would he do it? We're going to close with this. I promise I'm getting there. Later in this prophecy, the Lord declared that he would send his servant the branch, that is, he would send the Messiah, and through him he would remove the iniquity of the land in a single day. That just as on a single day of the year, the high priest would stand before God on one single day in history, the Messiah would decisively cleanse the stains of God's people 
that we could never cleanse ourselves from. And he would do it by becoming the filthiness of the curse of God for us. That he would take our filthy rags upon his back and die for us so that we could take his righteous garments. And he did this in a way that mirrored the way the high priest did it on the Day of Atonement. The high priest had a week separated from death. Jesus had a week teaching his disciples that he was about to die. Jesus also had his all-night vigil, but not with a group of his friends to comfort him. It was rather a night in which he was abandoned, betrayed, and beaten. Jesus also had special garments. He was clothed with the garments of a poor man, which were ripped from him in humiliation. Jesus also had a special hat. It was not a clean turban, but it was a crown of thorns. And he also had a ceremonial bath but it was the spit of those who mocked him. But that high priest entered the presence of God without a spot. No accusation could stand against that high priest that Jesus marched into the very heavens offering himself for your sins. That's what he did. And that friends, is why you and I can stand righteous before God. It's why we can seek to live a life pleasing him because we know that we have been clothed from on high. We know the price that was paid for us. We know what we naturally had, though we think we can clean ourselves up. We are filthy before God, but not Jesus. And he came and exchanged robes with us. Dearly beloved, you cannot cleanse yourselves. Try as hard as you may, you cannot do it. This is why Jesus had to die to save you, and he did. Put on Christ by faith today. Trust in him, rest in him, and hide in him. Today and every day, let's pray together. Father, we thank you that though we are unable to clean ourselves, that you sent Christ, Lord, who was clean from all eternity, who was perfectly righteous, to take our sins upon his back. Oh, Lord, would you help us to be clothed with him? Would you help us, Lord, to walk in lives and in manners that reflect the price that was paid for us, that reflect your holy law? And now, Lord, as we come to your table, we pray that you would, uh, that you would nourish us here. Father, we are hungry. We pray that you would feed us. We pray that you would grow us in your grace, Lord. We pray that you would speak to our hearts, that you would feed us, Lord, and grow us in faith as we take this ordinary bread and this ordinary cup. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to invite the servers and the musicians to join me here on stage or in the front for the servers. And as they come down, we're going to confess our faith together. So I ask you, people of God, what is it that you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This is our faith. It's what God has revealed to us. This was not invented by man nor by men. It was revealed by God. And if you have put your trust in Jesus Christ, if you have repented of your sins, and have clung to him in faith as he is freely offered in the gospel. If you are a part of his church, if you have received the sign of baptism that he declared that all who turn to him in faith receive, if that is you, then I want to welcome you to this table. I want you to know that this table is open to you, that that as you come forward, you're called to confess your sins and to trust anew in Christ who was given for you. This is a meal of peace for you. It is a reminder of you that as surely as we as we touch the bread and 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 taste the cup so surely did jesus christ come in the flesh to die for you he is your peace this is a meal of peace for you but if however you haven't believed in jesus christ as your savior and lord if maybe today is your first day ever in a church or 
or maybe you've come your whole life, but you've never believed. If that is you, I want to thank you so much for coming, and I want you to come again. And please, ask questions. Get to know uh, people here. Get to, get to see what, what people are like who, who follow the crucified Lord. But we would ask that you would not participate in this meal because it represents something that you don't believe in. And the scriptures say it would not do you good. There are some prayers printed for you in the worship guide. Please read them, and please turn to Christ. He will turn no one away who comes to him with repentant faith. The way we do it here at Truth Point, if you're new, is in a moment, I'll invite you to come forward, and you'll exit your row to the left, come down, take the elements, and then return to your seat up the other aisle. Uh, we'll, partic we'll participate in the meal together. You have a couple of choices down here. We have regular bread and then gluten bread, which is in a little basket, gluten-free bread, which is in a little basket. And then we have wine or juice. The juice is white grape juice. It'll be on the outside ring. On the inside rings is uh, red wine. So in a moment, I'm going to invite you to come forward and to participate in uh, the celebration of the death of the Son of God. On the night the Lord was betrayed, he took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, this is my body given for you. In the same manner, after the meal was over, he took a cup and he blessed it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is shed for the remission of sins and is shed for many. Brothers and sisters, when you're ready, come to the table of the Lord Jesus Christ. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flow be of sin and double cure. Save from wrath and make me pure.
on the night he was betrayed, our Lord took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the meal was over, our Lord took a cup, and knowing full well that he would drink the cup of divine wrath for your sins and mine, our Lord took an ordinary cup and he blessed it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Would you please stand?
Amen. Now look up and receive his benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Go in the peace that Jesus Christ has won for you. But hey, don't go yet. It's Coffee Fellowship Day. Go uh, learn about Youth for Christ. Uh, get to know your brothers and sisters. We'll see you next week.